Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the chairman and founder of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another identity conversation. And I have with me Clay Skadal, who I've known for the last 10 years or so uh, with his colleague, Craig Pfeiffer. And we, we've worked together on, on, on various initiatives. And, and today, uh, Clay is a principal at Riskbridge Advisors which is serving high net worth families and and endowment funds and foundations. So welcome, Clay. Thanks, Hugh. Glad to be here with you. So, Clay, why don't you just to get started, tell me a little bit about, you know, your life background, background in financial services, which is pretty deep, and how you got to this place of uh, working with high net worth families and foundations with RiskBridge. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks you for uh, this opportunity to share things with you. Um, you know, my I've been in the financial services industry now for, gosh, probably close to almost 40 years. Um, I, I started right out of college. Um, it's kind of a funny story. I, I was a political science major and um, I, I needed one class to graduate. And so I had a that class was only given spring term. And so I had this big block of time I didn't know what to do with. And uh, my advisor said, well, why don't you, why don't you do an internship? And I said, that's a great idea. So I actually got an internship uh, at the Department of Commerce in Helena, Montana for the state of Montana. Well, lo and behold, the, the director who I was assigned to the director's office, um, the director was on a leave of absence from Merrill Lynch. The governor had appointed him to be the, uh, uh, the director, and uh, he had taken a number of years off as a sabbatical, I guess, uh, from Merrill to be able to do that. Well, my job, I did a lot of things, but I spent a lot of time, fortunately, with that person. And, uh, you know, there's Montana's a big state, so there's a lot of, a lot of windshield time back then when you're driving around. Um, you know, and, and eventually the question, you know, came up, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I kind of went through this and, and after a while, I really decided that, you know, the financial services industry was something that, that I wanted to be a part of. And so once I did graduate, I spent time uh, interviewing and, and finally found a position, uh, started with a little firm called EF Hutton, um, back in 1983, and uh, I, I stayed with the same firm um, for the next 30 years. Uh, you know, the names changed a lot of times as we merged and, and uh, you know, the, everything that went on in Wall Street. But I really started with, uh, you know, being at the time we called it an account executive where I worked with individual families, um, you know, helping them to grow their retirement assets or provide income when they retired. Uh, and I, ju I just really enjoyed that, uh, that work, you know, with those individuals. I, from there, I uh, moved up, uh, continued to work with individual clients, but also became a branch manager. Uh, and so uh, relocated a couple times uh, within the firm to do that. And uh, the last position I had, I was out where I'm living today in Oregon, um, where I eventually you know, became a what's called a complex manager and was responsible for the operations of all the Smith Barney and Morgan Stanley uh, branches at the time in the state of Oregon, except for Portland, one of my peers at the Portland area. And, and what I found there, Hugh, was I was able to work with our top producers in all those branches to help them um, make sure that they were providing all the resources that the firm could offer to their, their top clients. And so I, I really became engaged in the, um, the needs of the ultra high net worth family from, you know, estate planning to, uh, you know, philanthropy to, uh, um, you know, foundations, endowments, all those different things. And it, and it was really intriguing to me because there's always, something happening. And there's always a, a challenging puzzle to put together when you're, when you're dealing with, uh, with high net worth people. Um, I ended up 
Uh, back uh, 2013, after 30 years doing that, I decided to leave the industry. Um, and uh, that's where, you know, Craig and I kind of reconnected. Yep. And we started this little firm called Advisors Ahead. I uh, did that for a number of years. And then I, I came across a couple of old friends from the City Group and Smith Barney days that were uh, actually working for a private bank uh, up in uh, Connecticut that was really focused on the, uh, the ultra high net worth, uh, the family office space, um, and, and working, if you would, in a holistic way of, of helping uh, families and small institutions uh, with, with the issues that they had. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, and then at the start of uh, this year, Again, I reconnected with Craig and uh, uh, another old Citigroup uh, Smith Barney alumni, Bill Kennedy, uh, where uh, Bill and uh, Craig had established a, um, an outsourced CIO firm, a chief investment officer firm, uh, that is really focused on similar things in terms of family offices, foundations, and endowments. Uh, we call it the underserved market. Uh, where, you know, your billion dollar plus funds uh, have a lot of coverage. But when you start, you know, coming down the line, that 100 million and under a foundation endowment, uh, you know, high net worth family, uh, they're not seeing, you know, the services that the large institutions are. And, and uh, that's, that's what we're bringing to them. And it was kind of full circle for me because it, it allowed me to come back to, you know, working with, the individuals again, that one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, helping and and uh, you know, working with people, which I really enjoy. So that's a long-winded answer of where I've been and, and kind of where we've come from. No, I think it's a, it, it, you know, it, it's a great story because you know you spent a lot of your time for well, forty years since nineteen eighty-three in financial services, but it's been. Quite, quite a diverse career in financial services because you've, you've had leadership roles where you've had to lead people and then you've had more of the roles where you're actually interfacing with the client more directly. Yes. If, if, I, if I picked it up uh, the right way and, and, and in the middle of that dealing with pretty complex problems, you know, the high, the high net worth families have, uh, each of them have unique needs and, and the and the financial problems are, are quite complex. I think you used the word puzzle. Um, right, that's right. But do you do you find have you found though, Clay, you know, in your career, you're happier when you're dealing with the client solving that complex puzzle, putting it together, or or more leading people who are doing that. You know, it's it it's that's that's an interesting question, Hugh. And, and I say that because I really, really enjoy um, having that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with the individuals and, and seeing the, if you would, the puzzle come together and seeing, you know, what we're developing together, because it, it really starts with getting a complete understanding of you know, where they're at in their life and, and what are their underlying values and the goals that yeah. they have that they're trying to accomplish and then start working to build um, solutions to find those. So that, you know, because to me, that's the intellectual challenge. It's, okay, these are the issues that you've got. Now let's figure out if we can find ways to create or to solve or to, to find a solution to that. The flip side to that, though, is there's also huge satisfaction for me um, to take, for lack of a better term, the intellectual capital that I've developed over the last 40 years and to share that with other people in the industry. Because I really believe that one of the things that I have a responsibility to do is to develop the next generation and, and to help them uh, continue on, you know, doing the quality work that needs to be done for families. And so, and so somebody's got to do that, right? And 
yeah, so teaching, so teaching the next generation of advisors, the uh, you know whether you call it the the Gen X, millennials, Gen Gen Y, bringing a few of them along, um, and of course they're going, you know, they're going to be the age group of 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 quite a lot of the inheritors as well. That's exactly right, and you know it, it goes back to you know the model that you and Craig and I have talked about so many times. It's about mentoring, right? Yep. Um, it, it's about bringing somebody on and, and teaching them and mentoring them the business, like like in the medical field or you know in the legal field, where you know we're bringing on that junior person and mentoring them and teaching. You know, it's that apprenticeship um, to to help them learn it. You know, I always say, you know, you're gonna. My job is is as we go through this career, there's a lot of high hurdles you're gonna hit. If I can make those high hurdles speed bumps, then that's that's better for everybody. We can't eliminate them, but you know I've probably already hit that high hurdle. So let me help you understand, you know, how we can avoid it. So in, in a way, working with Riskbridge, if 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 the new family and or foundation sometimes they come together uh, are, are acquired or you know brought into brought into the firm to be serviced. You know, in a way, you would lead. You would be leading the the engagement and being one on one there with the family, uh, discovering their needs, getting to uh, the root of their goals, what they want to do with the money, which I think we should talk about in in, in a minute as well. But also bringing along some, you know, Gen X, Gen Y uh, people, uh, planners uh, in the making, the future. <laughs> Family advisors, pub, you know, puzzle, puzzle, puzzle solvers of the future with you. Uh, That's right. So, so, so that there's a you know an end-to-end -end team for that family to deal with. That's right, and I think it's important that you know that that we build out the continuity so that yeah. um, a family understands that um, we have a plan in place to help them with their plan, because in most cases when you're dealing with a high net worth family um, in particular, it's multi-generational, right? It's the funds that a high net worth family has are multi-generational funds that, that we need to understand the impact of whether it's Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4 um, going forward and to start to develop a roadmap uh, to help, you know, from a family governance standpoint, help them to understand that we need to create that vision. We need to have a mission in place and we need to have a plan um, because this money is multi-generational and, and we need to make sure that it continues to have good stewards um, as, as we go forward in the plan for the family. And we also need the continuity in our end to be able to serve gen two, three, four and whatever it might be. So when I talked about leadership before, it's not, it, 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 you know, I think if we distill it down, you're, you're in your sweet spot if you can be the advisor to the family, guiding them through the discovery, you know, solving the complex problems, but also, you know, that is leadership of that family and getting them to the right place. And because uh, when you're, when, you know, when you are a, 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 an advisor, a good advisor, at least, you're always a leader, I think. Um, and, and then it's also leading, leading the team with you to provide that uh, holistic long-term service. And I think that's where the family governance piece comes in as well, because the, the, that sort of really puts a wrapper around the whole service to some degree. And it's part of the continuity plan. Someone's got to be on that team to serve that family from generation to generation. Right. It's very important. So... So if we if we look at your um, financial DNA style, uh, you know, and you've completed the the DNA discoveries, you know, starting many years ago, and 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 Clay, you're an influencer style person. So you, in in some ways, you like to you like to lead, but I think there's also an element of um, wanting to play teacher there as well, and to coach and facilitate people. You know what? What, how did you feel about uh, you know the DNA discovery when when you saw it and got it back and you know what what it was saying to you as to what you could you could be doing in, in, you know in, in your uh, place of excellence? Yeah, you know it it's funny because I remember 
you know, getting the, getting the first result back and, and you kind of look at it. And if you're being honest with yourself, you know, you go, wow, that's me. You know, you, you, when you really dig down into it and you look at it and you go, that's me, I'm looking in the mirror. Um, you know, I can see myself in all these different situations. I think, I think the most important piece that I took away from that though, Hugh was, um, what were the parts that were challenges for me? In other words, you know, what are the areas that I need to be aware of that if, that if I get into a certain, you know, situation or a certain conversation or, um, uh, you know, whatever that might be, what were the areas that, that I really needed to be aware of uh, to make sure that I could improve myself? And I think there's that whole piece about, when I looked at it, yes, this is me, but I'm always that type that says, how do I become better? We can never, you know, I always used to tell employees and things like that, you know, I'm not out here trying to be the greatest firm or the greatest, you know, advisor out there because that's not the vision. The vision is to always become better. And so if we can continue to, to do better, be better and grow, um, you know, to me, that's, that's success and that's um, uh, fulfilling, right? And so I, I think, you know, the biggest part of that was, was looking at where my challenges were and how could, I, how could I continue to grow and be aware of, you know, certain areas and situations. Yeah, because I think it's important that you ensure that the, the struggles don't, don't get in the way of, uh, of the strengths. They don't derail you at the, at, at the end of the day. Right. And, you know, in your report, you've got a couple of uh, strength areas, you know, wanting to take charge, which is really lead and setting the direction, but also you're quite spontaneous and intuitive and, and also clay creative, you know, th- those, uh, those talents come out. So, you know, it's no surprise to me that you like to solve uh, complex puzzles. You're probably quick on the spot in the room uh, with a client at, at, at seeing what the problem is and connecting, helping them connect the dots. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I'll mention that, um, which was part of, you know, we did the communication DNA, right? Yeah. And probably the thing that I took away from that most was understanding not my, not the way I communicate, but how others communicate. So when you're in a conversation, you can kind of see, oh, okay, that's, that's their communication style. And, and I can step back and think about, okay, how do, I, how do I make sure they understand what I'm saying? And so to understand their communication style, it, it helped me understand how to be much more impactful in terms of of people understanding our conversation because you know how sometimes you get that look where you you just have the nod and you know, it's just going boom, right over their head. Um, You know, you, you've got to be able to, to bring it down to a, uh, a common denominator that everybody can understand. Um, And, and so to understand, to have an understanding of how to see the different types of communicating styles that are out there, helps you to understand how do you bring it down to the lowest common denominator to make it understandable. Yeah. And just for our listeners, what, what Clay is saying is to, un, to, to, to deal with others and to communicate with others, you firstly got to understand yourself. And I just want everybody to know if you'd like to go and do your own trial, you can go to our website at dnabehavior.com and you can take a financial DNA uh, trial or a communication DNA trial, which is just very specific on communication. But this is something that's very important, isn't it, Clay, in families, because you and your team are going to show up, uh, and, and you guys will be different, are going, are going to show up and deal with a range of family members, whether it's, you know, mum and dad or patriarch and matriarch and one or two generations of children, and understanding all their perspectives is vital if you're going to... Uh, solve the problem for them ultimately, you know, one, identi- actually identify the problem because it could be partly them that's the problem or, or, or differences that they have uh, of opinion with what to do with the money because 
what they do with the money is it a reflection of themselves to some degree. Um, but, you know, given that a lot of you, what I understand, a lot of your work is also helping them see, okay, they've got a choice. Do they give, do they pass the money down and pay a whole lot of uh, uh, taxes to Uncle Sam in estate planning tax, or do they push it into a foundation that they can manage and give the money to people, you know, to people that, uh, uh, that are in need? And, um, you know, getting the family on, on, on the same page to do that is in, can be incredibly difficult, given everybody might have different desires to, with what they think they're going to do with the money, even though they may, may not have earned it. Yeah, that, that that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I used to joke that, you know, what we're dealing with is all the family dynamics, right? Yeah. And and um, I, I was saying that, you know, there at times it's kind of like, you know, there's a big wedding coming up this summer, but nobody knows whether Uncle John's going to show up or not. And, uh, and uh, you know, how are you going to deal with, you know, Aunt Susie? And, you know, you've got all these family dynamics that, that come into it. And so you've got to really, you know, try to bring everybody at least to a common ground um, of understanding because when you're dealing a lot of times with, um, you know, a, a, an ultra high net worth family or just, you know, a foundation or an endowment uh, that's out there, the, the focus that we really had when we started this firm was that for us, we've spent, you know, many, many years in this industry and, and we've learned a lot, you know, we stubbed our toe sometimes and, um, you know, things, but we've learned a lot over the last, you know, 40 years of doing this. And partly our way of giving back is to say, look, if we know that we need to protect principle, because if we can protect principle for the long run, because, you know, foundations and endowments, right, the investment timeline for them is perpetuity. Yeah. And so, what we need to be able to do is protect your money first, but also grow it for you. But the same thing with a family, when you've got multi-generational money, it's about how do we move it forward? And if we can protect those assets and help to grow them at a, at a faster pace, you know, that's, that's more money that can be spent to, you know, to help people that need food you know, people that, you know, are in need of medical services, provide more scholarships, uh, you know, for education, whatever the vision or mission of the, the family or uh, the foundation or endowment is, you know, our end objective is A, to help protect that money into perpetuity and B, help to grow it so we can provide more services and be of more need to those of need. Yeah, and in a way, it's quite a complex calculation, isn't it? Depending on, you know, how many kids there are in the family and potentially grandchildren. Of course, you can grow the money in the foundation. You can also grow the family's principal assets, juggling the ball on what taxes will get paid, how old are mum and dad, everybody's living longer. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a complex puzzle, as you've used the term, of, you know, financial calculations, but also dealing with, um, life calculations and life uh, life expectations, not just life ex expectancy, but the but the life expectations of, of all the people involved and ensuring that everybody's reconciled to the outcome. Because this is also about the family's identity, and and if they can protect the capital and have more money going to help people in need, that's good for the family identity as well. You know, that's a in a way it's a rallying cry for the family. That's why I've always been. Uh, in favour of this, particularly in the United States, where the rules are, are more favourable for this kind of approach than perhaps other countries that are a bit more restrictive, or it's not as culturally uh, the done thing to do, you know. But 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 the sort of way I was looking at it this as well, Clay, is you know it's the it's the complex calculations, but it's the family dynamics, but it's the family identity that's there, which I think you know to to our other discussion about family governance statements is something that's probably quite important um, with all of this. It is. And, you know, uh, the one thing that we always find in it, whether it's in the asset investing side or in the finding the, uh, 
the vision that the family wants to support, the underlying thing behind it is it's emotions. Yep. Right. And um, there's emotions about how the market moves and what are we doing with our money and, and all these other things. And then there's the family side about emotions of, um, you know, the children seeing that, you know, here's a pool of $50 million that they're not going to see, but look, if it, it's either going to go to uncle Sam or we can, we can plan around it and, and do some, some good and, and help the family, um, you know, presence. Uh, and in some cases bring the family together in, in terms of a, a, um, a focused vision and mission that the family's working towards. And so, you know, there's all these things that come around it, but, but at the end of the day, you're, you're really working with emotions. Yeah. You're working with emotions. I, I always looked at it and said, if you can get the family to sit down to Thanksgiving dinner together, all the generations and not be throwing bricks at each other across <laughs> the table, then you probably succeeded. And the talking point for them can become this foundation where they're all doing good. And, and the children that perhaps haven't gone out there and done the hard work and taken the risks of earning the money, perhaps have just got to learn, reframe their own thinking about, you know, what their life's going to be and their own purpose. And is the purpose going to be inside uh, working with the foundation and making decisions around it and, and doing some activities there or going out and doing their own thing and striking out and, and, and creating right. their own identities? They're, that's right. And, and I think that's a big part of the emotional management as well. Um, yeah. But emotions make this whole business of uh, managing the complex jigsaw puzzle uh, extremely complex, you know. Oh, it is. It is. And, you know, there are, there are days that you, that's why I don't have any hair left. There are days you pull your hair out, you know, trying to bring everybody together. Uh, and then, you know, then there are the days when it all comes together and, you know, there's this big, big kumbaya moment. Uh, and, and as there's just such, um, you know, gratitude to watch that, you know, where there, where it finally comes together. And so, you know, so, so it, as it, you know, and using the words coming together, if we, if we pull this together, Clay, as we wrap up, uh, this, this conversation, how do you see your own identity, you know, in terms of, your being in, in, in working with these high net, high net worth families? I guess, you know, to me, it's, um, again, it's, I, I just feel like it's the larger purpose that, you know, as we, as we come to the, you know, the, I'm certainly not at the beginning of my career, um, no. And so as I, as I started to think about, um, you know, what legacy do I want to leave? Um, you know, when, when I'm no longer physically here, um, it, it's really a legacy of, of sharing and, and specifically helping families and institutions um, continue to deliver um, services and needs to, to groups, to industries, to families, to whatever it might be uh, that, that can benefit from it and, and really to help people think outside the box. There, there are, you know, so many times I find that um, we have to educate people on what can be done. Um, because they're just not aware of the tools. And rightly so, because people have spent their life and their career building a successful business or uh, developing, you know, a successful uh, organization. And, you know, they're not spending their time looking at other pieces. And so once we kind of educate them on, look, this is, have you thought about this? Or were you aware that, you know, this could happen? Um, it opens up this giant toolbox of, of instruments that, that can be used to uh, really create something special. And so to me, you know, some people like to paint, some people like to, you know, do other things. I guess if you were to put it uh, in, in that term, this is my art, right? This is the art that I'm going to leave is that, you know, we developed, we helped draw 
we, you know, we filled the colors in and, you know, look at this beautiful piece that's hanging on the wall now that uh, is going to be there uh, for a long time. Really, in a way, your art is putting together the family financial jigsaw puzzle. That's right. That then leads to helping the family do good for the long term. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so, so Clay, just to wrap up, have you got any tips for our listeners or uh, other families out there, things that they should do, read, listen to, watch? Well, you know, I, I would say, first of all, and, you know, um, I, I truly mean this to everybody that's out there and it's not a, I'm not, you know, here putting a big plug in <laughs> for you and everything, but I would tell you that the work he has done, um, the first thing that I would do is I would, I would take the, the financial DNA, you know, if you have the opportunity to do it so you can understand where you are on the spectrum and where your other family members are. Um, because it's going to enable you to, um, you know, to, to really have an understanding of where everybody's at. And it's a, it's a base to have a conversation off of. And so, you know, first thing I'd recommend is figure out where you are uh, on the, on the DNA, you know, financial scale. It, it very, very helpful. I think, you know, the other thing to, to continue to do is to um, find like peer groups you know, there are family office groups, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of speakers that, you know, you can just find on, um, you know, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or something like that, to talk about family governance, to talk about things like that, to get an understanding of what that really means. Um, and, um, you know, be, get a group of peers together that uh, there are people that have gone through similar things as others and, you know, learn, learn from them. You know, you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, there are starting points out there and people that are willing to help. And so I think um, you've got to be willing to dream. And, you know, once you have a dream, then find the right people that can help you take that dream and turn it into a reality. Yeah, I think it is important that, that families uh, talk to other families you know, to, to peer groups, learn what, what they've done, because there's plenty of others that have uh, uh, been ahead of you. They've, they've got the war stories. It's like me. I'm part of one called Entrepreneurs Organization for Entrepreneurs. All of us have got a war story, and, 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 or a few of them. Um, as right. you said, we've all stubbed our toes with a few things. And, you know, it's life. It happens. You don't grow if you, if you don't go through that. And I think the other thing is with the financial DNA for anyone listening, the, you know, the big, the big reason is, is to understand the differences in the family and have a conversation about it while everybody is alive. Uh, this doesn't work too well if you're trying to deal with what someone thought or what the expectations or entitlements were when you're reading the will after someone's passed away. Uh, that, that's a, you know, the, the key giver of, of, of the money or pass it down to the wealth. It's useless then. Um, right. So everyone's got to have the courage to have it in, in, in the lifetime and, and, and make those choices. I think that's really important. I agree. So thank you, Clay. It's been great spending time with you today. Thanks, you. I appreciate it. Best to you and your family and uh, I look forward to chatting again. 